Good evening. Tonight we are in Lesson 10, Keeping Contentment. And our text is found in Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5. And it says this, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The tenth commandment goes past the outward issues of life directly to the heart. And so God is concerned about our heart. And uh, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So what we think about is what we're going to talk about. But again, in Exodus uh, 20, verse 17, it says this, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Again, covetousness begins in the heart and is made manifest outwardly for months or and so we don't know about, sometimes you don't know somebody's covetousness for, for many years, and then it's, it comes out. But the Christian religion is a religion of the heart, not a religion of the outward or external regulations. It starts with asking a Jesus in our heart, and it continues with worshiping God from our heart. Notice the emphasis the Apostle Peter put on uh, this area of being content. In 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Speaking of uh, women, but it, uh, uh, it says this, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And so here, it's, it's, it's telling us that the hidden uh, person of the heart is more important than the outward uh, look of a person. Okay, I remember when in college, uh, people would say, well, is wear makeup wrong? Obviously, it's not. And uh, my, one of my teachers, Dr. Wendell Evans, said, if the bar needs painting, paint it. <laughs> but anyways... Anything can be taken to the extreme. And so we need to, uh, full, um, uh, again, God looks on the out, um, heart, but man does look on the outward appearance. And so some people can look very spiritually. They maybe look spiritual, but God knows if they actually are spiritual. The hidden man of the heart is the part that only God sees again. Sometimes maybe a young Christian can think that um, Christianity is all about the exterior. They might even think that if they have a lot of worldly goods that they're godly. But we know this not to be true because uh, the Bible um, often focuses on uh, other things, doesn't really focus on material goods at all. Uh, speaking of material goods, uh, this week... Um, where I worked, they had a rummage shell, and I I bought I, I got a few things and brought them over the border and paid for them and had a handwritten receipt. And when I came in, uh, when I was buying a few things, I told the lady, I feel kind of greedy. She's like, don't feel greedy. All of us have two to three times as much stuff as we need in our houses. <laughs> we have so much stuff. And it was actually their best sell. They made, I think, 1400 so it was a, they did pretty well. Uh, but uh, one, one young lady came by and she, um, she had just bought a brand new um, dining room set with uh, chairs and table. And then she came to our cell and bought our table and chairs, the dining hall. But she said, the one I bought didn't fit. And so what am I saying? I'm saying we need to learn contentment. Jesus warned us against allowing our lives to revolve around possessions. In Luke 12, 15, it says, Jesus said this, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. 
And so some people might feel more important if they have a nicer car or house or whatnot. But Jesus explains that a man's life is much more than what he owns. So how are we to be a content Christian? Number one, the concept of contentment. There are several indications of a contented person. When a person is content, he could describe himself in the following ways. A, David said, my heart is settled. In Psalms 57, 7, he said, My heart is fixed. O oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. A discontented man, on the other hand, his heart is not fixed. His heart is unsettled. Perhaps he is discontented with his wife or his job or the car he drives or many other areas. It makes him feel uneasy and dissatisfied until he gets what he wants. Then because he is a discontented man, he will want something else and the cycle repeats itself. In Matthew 5, 8 it states, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God desires our hearts to be pure before him and he wants us to be satisfied with him. Ask yourself this question tonight. Would you be satisfied, would I be satisfied, I'm preaching myself, if all my earthly possessions were taken away and all I had was, I shouldn't say all I had was God, but I had God and everything was taken away. I had salvation. Uh, some say, well, that might be kind of extreme, but we, again, as we see the news in Germany, we see many people that their, ho their homes were totally destroyed by the floods. We see in Greece and Turkey where their, their houses were burned to the ground. And so some of these people, they literally don't know what to do, and we pray for them. But um, what, as you as a Christian, what would you do if everything was taken away? Would your heart still be fixed? That would be, that would be tough, but we should have a, a, a heart that's settled. B, my focus is heavenward. We know that this earth, there, it isn't all there is. We know that um, one day uh, we have a heaven to look forward to, Jesus to look forward to, and it's not all in this world. Colossians 3.1 says, If ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And so when we focus on things above, we're focusing on God's word. We're focused on seeing people come to Christ. So uh, they don't have to be in a lost eternity. They could be in heaven with God and with other uh, people of God. <clears throat> I found a little story here. And it says a Quaker, okay? <laughs> a Quaker, in order to impress a lesson upon his neighbors, put up a sign on a vacant piece of ground next to his house, which read, I will give this lot to anyone who is really satisfied. A wealthy farmer, as he rode by, read it. Stopping, he said, since my Quaker friend is going to give me that piece anyway, or, or that piece away, I may as well have it as anyone else. I am rich, I have all I need, and I'm able to qualify. He went up to the door, and when the aged friend appeared, explained why he had come. And is thee really satisfied? Asked the owner of the lot. I surely am, was the reply. I have all I need, and I am very well satisfied. Friend, said the other, if thee is satisfied, what dost thee want my lot? <laughs> and so we need to learn, again, to be content with what we have. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And so uh, whatever we have, we're to do to the glory of God. Be grateful, thankful for what we do have. See, my trust is in God. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
And so what does this mean? We are to seek what God wants first. We're to put God first. Uh, somebody said the acronym JOY is God first. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Jesus first. Others second. And yourselves last. And somebody said, well, uh, you know, anyway. And so we can, we can have that joy that, um, that Jesus gives by putting others before ourselves. And that's not what the world says. The world says put yourself first. Put what you want first and do what you want, and uh, then you'll be happy. But Jesus says, you know, put me, me first, others second, yourself third, D, my life has yielded. Jesus knows those areas that come between us and, and him. Anything that we hold back from him reveals our covetousness. Such was the case of a rich young ruler. We see this story in Luke chapter 18. The Bible says, A certain ruler asked him, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why call sell me good? There is none good save God. See, one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. So he went through the commandments and basically said, I've kept all those commandments when Je and uh, from my youth up. Now, when Jesus had heard these things, he said, you're lacking one thing. Go sell all you have and give to the poor and you shall have uh, and distribute and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. The Bible says, and when he heard these things, he was very sorrowful for he had great riches. And so um, Jesus, when he said this, he, he said this, How hardly shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God? And so his disciples heard this and they thought, well, then who can be saved? But the point Jesus was making was not that because, because he was rich, he wasn't going to go to heaven. That wasn't the point. The point was that he was allowing his riches to keep him from trusting in God. And so, in our lives, we, whether we're rich or poor or middle, what do they say, middle class or upper middle class or whatever, even, even somebody that is poor can be covetous. You know, um, I believe it was Ron Blue, he's a financial man, and he said one day he was in a a meeting with a like a national pastor in a for a distant foreign country and he said this what is the biggest obstruction to getting the gospel out and he said it's covetousness if a man has one acre he wants two if he has a tin house he wants a stone house and he and then he, ron blue realized hey just because they're poor doesn't mean they don't struggle with covetousness Somebody that's poor can struggle with that just as well as somebody that's middle class or rich. And so this area affects us all. Number two, the convictions of contentment. Contentment can only be maintained by choosing to live by biblical convictions. A, it says, don't neglect our marriages. So if somebody that always has to have the best of everything, that can put a strain on on marriages and we see that we see that around where uh, people they have to have the best of everything and it really doesn't go well for them proverbs 21 22 1 says this a good name is rather be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold and so the bible says your name is worth more than your money the world says who cares about your name just get all you can <laughs> but god but god's ways are better Somebody that puts their career before their family or neglects uh, uh, time with their family and other uh, maybe hobbies or whatever, they're, they're uh, building a life of discontent. We need to treasure our relationships. We need to treasure marriages. Exodus 20, 17 says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And so... Uh, We need to continue to uh, treat our wives the uh, best as possible. B, don't lose your balance. A covetous life is an imbalanced life. 
Ephesians 5, 15, it says this, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The word circumspectly means in balance. In a busy pace, we can easily get out of balance. I was talking to my brother this week, called me for my birthday uh, a number of days back, and I talked to him, and I, and I said, Jake, how many hours do you work a week, 60 or 80? He said, how many hours are in a week? I said, 168. He said, that's how many I work, meaning that he's like on call, over $10 stores managing. And one of the biggest issues they're having right now is uh, uh, supply, stocking the stores. There's not workers to stock the stores and there's not a lot of drivers to get the goods to the stores. And the customers don't understand that. They can't understand why things aren't there. And so it's a little bit difficult for him. But he made the statement, he said this, I want my life to be more balanced. <laughs> I want to get back to more balance. But number one, um, how, how do we get back? What, what fights against this is number one, fatigue. Excessive fatigue is sometimes God's way of reminding us to get back into balance. Proverbs 23, 4, it says, Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. And so uh, we're not to wear ourselves out to get riches. Uh, one preacher said that... Uh, he, he knew, he knew uh, people that they worked half their life to get wealth and then their health gave out and then they had to spend the last of their life paying for health. <laughs> and so there's a balance in there somewhere God has for us that uh, we can be satisfied. Number two, dissatisfaction. There are people who just can't seem to be satisfied. Ecclesiastes 5.10 He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver nor he that loveth the abundance with increase. This also is vanity. And so a person that has a thought, well, oh, if I just had a little bit more, then I would be happy. Then I would be joyful. No, we won't be joyful until we put Jesus first, other second, and ourselves last. Somebody might be here listening online and say, but that doesn't make sense. A lot of stuff doesn't make sense. But the Bible says this, that we are to live by faith. Some might say, well, that's a blind faith. Regardless, we are to live by faith, not by sight. And that's easier, that's easier said than done sometimes. Sometimes it's difficult to live by faith. Sometimes it's not easy and we don't know uh, how things are going to work out. Number three, debt. Some people charge themselves into an excessive amount of debt in their quest to appear successful. Brother Chapel says this, his illustration says this. It seems like girls are expert spenders at an early age. I saw a birthday card for a father to give to his daughter. The outside read, where could I find a daughter like you? And the inside read, I don't know, but the mall would be a good place to start. Nick is over his head in credit card debt. He is a hard worker. But his desire for more possessions has caused him to overspend on his budget. And now he is struggling to pay his bills. Nick's church is collecting a special offering for a new building and an exciting sign of church growth. Nick, however, is frustrated because he is so strapped financially and that he cannot be involved in this effort. Instead of seeing his root issue of covetousness, his unbalanced perspective leads him to bitterness towards the church for giving him an opportunity. So rather than being thankful that there's a building program to give to, he is uh, bitter at the church that they're talking about money. And I find that can be true, right? If, if money is uh, tight, uh, people's antenna goes up, and they if you mention anything about money, boy, they can get very sensitive about that. Um. And I have to say this about money. Some people are good accountants. Some people are better accounting than others. <laughs> I have a brother. I, I, I'm just going to say this. My brother in Arizona, he is, he is good with money. But you know what? I've never seen him to care about money. He's been, from what I've seen, 
And if you're watching this, Jamie, and you know, <laughs> you can get on me later, but he is content. And you know, out of all, out of all my brothers, I'm just going to say this, he is, he, he is doing pretty well. <laughs> But it, it, financially, I'm just going to say that and that, and not that finances are everything. But you know, I think God does bless those that aren't just going after the money. He does bless uh, that. I talked to my dad this week. He, um, he told me that the Lord's really blessed their RV business. He's paid off his house, he paid off his truck, and he paid off the whole business. I said, awesome, Dad. <laughs> That's great. That's good. And what am I saying? I'm saying this, that um, God can take care of us better than we can take care of ourselves. Sometimes I think, well, man, you know, I'll be honest. Like sometimes I have thought, well, maybe if I did something else, maybe I could. But God has called us to Canada. But, you know, it's not all about the finances. It's about people. Okay. Number, what can get us, though? Worry. Worry is a main, major culprit for throwing Christians off balance. Uh, in uh, my, my verse here, Mark 4, 18 and 19, it says this, And these are they that are sown among thorns, such as the word, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And so um, some people have let uh, worry of the cares of this world to overpass all spiritual growth. To um, uh, whether we'll say whether they come to church, say Sunday morning, whatever they maybe they'll ignore that just to do just to get a little bit more. And that's and Jesus is like a weed choking out the the fruit, <laughs> the the plant, and and or or maybe an activity comes up and they would rather than serving God in a certain way, they'll do what they want to do, but because they're they're worried, they're worried that they don't have enough. And then five, conflict. Conflict in many times is a result of covetousness. In James 4.1, it, it said, he said this, James says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust? That war in your members, ye lust, and have not, ye kill, and desire to have, and ye cannot, cannot obtain. Ye fight and ye war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. And then it goes on to say later, I believe, that uh, even those that ask in prayer, God doesn't always grant it because they ask that they may consume it on their own lust. <laughs> they just want something for themselves, not to help others, just they're selfishly focused on themselves. And so how can we do that? Uh, don't go to war. Go to prayer. <laughs> if if so, if, uh, if if uh, if there's a contention uh, with somebody, we need to go to prayer. And again, as I said, it's easier said than done. We need to continue to pray and ask God to help. C. Don't ruin relationships. So many people are willing to sacrifice relationships for possessions, but it's a poor trade. Uh, my mom uh, again. My mom told me this story um, when I was, told us this story that when we were growing up, one day my, my oldest brother came <laughs> and said, Mom, why don't I have everything that everybody else has? And my mom looked at him and said, called his name and says, I could, but then I won't be home anymore. And he thought, he thought about it for a minute. And he like, oh, you're right, Mom. <laughs> I'd rather have you home with me <laughs> than have a, a bunch of stuff. And so we can all learn from these things. D, don't lose integrity. Another conviction that we need to protect ourselves uh, from covetousness is that we should not lose our integrity while we move forward in this life. Those who are willing to sacrifice principles for possessions or integrity for increased wealth will find themselves on the road to destruction. And... Uh, that is true. And I was actually thinking about these two verses, 1 Timothy 6 and 9, 10. I was actually thinking about these verses this week even more. Uh, it says this, But they that will be rich 
will fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in per destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while some having coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay. And what did Paul tell Timothy, the young preacher, what did he tell him? He said, flee these things. And I used to wonder, why did he see the thief? Isn't money a good thing? No, flee. <laughs> it, it, it isn't a good thing if it's if, if, if what's the main focus. God is the main focus. And so it's so true. If money is taking somebody's focus off God, it isn't good. And so we need to flee. Uh, God does not condemn wealth in this verse. There were several wealthy people in the Bible. We know Abraham was wealthy. The Bible says he was very rich. We know Job was one of the wealthiest people in the world at that time. We know Solomon. He was a trillionaire, okay? He was rich. So God doesn't condemn money. He just warns us of putting money before God, okay? Covetousness is an ugly thing of the heart, but, we, but when it manifests, it's uglier. We should not lose our integrity in self-promotion. Some people, it's not money, it's promotion. They want to maybe have that position. They, they'll do anything to get that position. That's not a good thing. And so we shouldn't be concerned about position or promotion. We, be, we should be concerned about Christ, okay? Number three, characteristics of contentment. Paul's testimony gives us an example of a contented life. looks like Philippians 4.11, it says, Not that I need to speak in respect of want, for I have learned, in so over which state I am, therewith to be content. He said, no matter if I, if I have a lot or I don't have a lot, I am determined, I'm making a decision to be content. He said, I know what it is to go without food. I know what it is to have a lot and to have a little. But whatever condition I'm in, I am determined I am going to be content. And, uh, and so that's what we need to be. There was a quote I skipped. But um, anyway, Benjamin Franklin said this, Content makes poor men rich. Discontent makes rich men poor. And so let's start, uh, continue on here. A, be thankful. Thankful for God's blessing to us. The opposite of contentment is comparison. Developing a comparative thought pattern will rob our appreciation for the blessings God has given us. You know, keeping up with the Jones is trying to outdo somebody else. No, that's, that's not going to bring con um, happiness or contentment. The Bible says we need to be content with such things as we have. We have brought nothing into this world. And when we leave this world, we're not going to bring anything out either. And uh, I was talking to Dirk um, last Sunday, and I believe, and he's, he had mentioned somebody in the Sioux, Sioux Ontario, they died, had uh, two safes full of gold bars. Can you imagine? But they didn't bring it with them. And when... When and if he got to heaven, <laughs> you know, they're going to tell him that the streets are paved with that. Okay? And so, we need to uh, be concerned with what God wants. Job was a contented man, both in prosperity and in poverty. He was perhaps one of the, again, one of the wealthiest men in the world. Yet, we knew that his heart was set on God because... When he lost everything, he didn't curse God. He didn't uh, uh, um, uh, forsake God when all his children died in the whirlwind, when all his riches were taken, when all his health was taken, and he was sitting there in a pile of ashes. But the Bible says that at the end that God made it better with Job, that he had twice as many children. He had twice as many riches. But it says God turned his, his bad times when he prayed for his friends. I think that's a, that's a good 
good point. We, we see that um, Job and God dialoguing back and forth for 42 chapters. And then at the end, it says when he, when he prayed for his friends. You know, those three friends that were saying, this is why all these bad things happened to you. <laughs> and, and Job, uh, I think he probably tried to justify himself a little. I mean, that's natural. <laughs> we we want to justify. But I don't think uh, Job, all these bad things happened to him because he was wicked, but because the Bible says that God was making a point to Satan, <laughs> saying, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> Could God say that about you today? If Satan came and was putting a, um, God allowed him to put a test on your life, could God say, man, look at my servant so-and-so? And have you considered him? <laughs> that, uh, that's amazing, but that's, God thought highly of Job. But B, be thankful for God's blessing on others. And so we need to be thankful when good things happen to other people. Romans 12, 5 says, For we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every members, everyone members one of another. So if, if one person in the body of Christ or in the church is doing well, again, we should be grateful and happy and uh, thankful for them uh, that good things happen. If someone else's daughter gets good grades in school or son excels in sports, but it's not our son or our daughter, we should still rejoice for their family. If a co-worker gets a promotion at work that we were hoping for, we should congratulate them. And that's showing God's love, amen. C, thankful in our giving. The Bible says, God loveth a cheerful giver. And so when we give, we should be thankful and uh, uh, mention this morning a bit about giving. Uh, that we should be uh, um, giving back, uh, paying it forward, so to speak, for what all God has done when he, when, when he died on the cross for us. He gave his life for us, and we're just showing our gratitude. In fact, I believe one day we're going to say, Lord, I'm, man, I wish I would have given more. <laughs> but Lord willing, in this life, we could do do the best that we can in that area. J.L. Kraft, founder of Kraft Foods Incorporated, said, the only investment I ever made which paid consistently increasing dividends is money I have given to the Lord. I remember um, my wife's grandpa, uh, Joe Silball. Am I saying it right? So, yeah. He, uh, Joseph Silball, he, um, he said something similar. He was in a brethren church and their groups of churches would um, uh, give money toward, towards seeing other churches started. But it was like a, some kind of foundation. And he, and he told me one day, he said, Jeremy, the best investment I ever made, <laughs> they literally paid him, I don't know, a certain percent, but he actually got a percentage back <laughs> for, for giving to this godly cause. And uh, he, um, he said, that's the best investment I ever made. <laughs> it happened to be to help churches. And they paid, paid him back. But, and then last, we, D, be thankful for our salvation. If you had nothing but your salvation, you would still be wealthy. Saved people can be thankful and contented even when their investments crash and they are laid off from work or they lose their homes, which we've seen uh, happening around the world. People losing everything. Whatever losses those Christians suffer, they still have Jesus. You can always find something to be thankful for being a child of God. In conclusion, the first of the Ten Commandments was a command to put God in our lives. Put Him first. And the last is a warning not to allow any coveted thing to usurp God's place in our lives. It is a command to be satisfied with God himself and to enjoy the blessings he has given us as bonuses. We learn today that God is, uh, much broader, uh, has a much broader definition of contentment than we do. Keeping contentment involves resisting the passion to possess and deepening our passion for God. Obeying this command may be a challenge, 
but it's possible. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love to us and help us to uh, be content with what we have. In your precious name, amen.